behind the syllogism. It's not that they're lying to the public. It's that the judgment, the syllogism, is a formality, and everybody knows it's a formality. What matters is the conversation that occurs behind the scenes in the proper institutional space that has been given to the French judges to debate things. And they debate them in all the ways that we, the French, would want them to debate with all of the realism that Americans would demand, right? and they give judgment accordingly. Is this acceptable to Americans? No. Why? Because Americans, in the end, are not Catholic. <laughs> they don't believe in a curia. Right? They don't believe in governmental decision-making. They are, we are, I'm half American, we are populists. And to us, it's almost offensive to think that there would be some large meritocratic structure that would be making the arguments and judgments among themselves. Right? We should individually, as citizens, control, and that means everything needs to be in the open. And then we can have debates about whether it really is in the open. It's unclear. Right? But that idea that we individually as citizens must have access and must be able to take part in this debate is totally essential to Americans and American lawyers. Whereas for the French in the tradition, if you build a proper institution and make it properly representative and make sure that everyone in the system is properly trained, then as good Napoleonic meritocratic Republicans, that is properly democratic. Two different ideas of what democracy means. So that's the punchline, right? Two different ideas of what democracy means. One that is basically Republican, the French version, representative, and the American one, populist. Right? And basically, this non-understanding that comes in the, in the clothing of common law versus civil law is, in the end, an argument and disagreement about the nature of proper politics. Okay? All right. Um, so that's the gist of what I wanted to say. Um, what I, I have one final note, and then we'll open it up. The final note is that, as you can tell, I'm trying to make, take the French system seriously. And for an American, that's rare. <laughs> right? It looks terrible to Americans. The French system looks terrible, either formalist or elite right? and close. Terrible either way. I'm trying to take it seriously. However... In order to take it seriously, you have to actually believe in the Republican side of this, in the representational side of this. And as French society gets more complicated and more varied, and there is ever greater diversity within French culture, the idea that you could have one elite core of Republican representatives making decisions on behalf of the French state looks less and less acceptable, right? And the French are going through all kinds of internal fights precisely about whether their government, which they had always thought of in these kinds of Republican terms, is actually representative. And the answer more and more is no. Okay, So it's making for complications, and I believe that those complications are manifesting as a rise in fundamental rights arguments and fundamental rights institutions.
um, in the French system and increasingly in the European system too. Because the European system within the European Union, the, hand, the head court there is the European Court of Justice and it is modeled on the French system. Okay? And so that's making for difficulties. Okay, I'm going to stop and I'm happy to have the conversation go uh, any way you'd like it to go. Okay, so let me start with a question. Okay. To warm up. It's warm in here. Can I, am I allowed to take my jacket off? Yes. <laughs> it's warm in here, right? More than Only the jacket. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, oh, I think I have to use this. Of recording. We are recording just for you to know. Estamos grabando. Um, it's very interesting, but there, there's, I mean, there, there's a sense of power here and the power that judges discover when they realize that through their arguments they can transform the juridical system. You can call it transform the law, transform the constitution, but they can transform yes. the juridical system and their consequences. Yes. And that power, it seems like in the French system, it's restrained by the law or the constitution, in a sense. At least with the syllogism, that's what that's what judges tend to try to demonstrate, that they are still you know, restrained by it. And in the American perspective, it's what Bosner may call the self-restraint. I mean, the judges are good judges that they know that they cannot push you know, their decisions so far as to make social changes that are going to make them lose power. But then you have cases like our case, like the Colombian case. And the Constitutional Court is a very driven Constitutional Court, but also it's a constitutional court that is, it has recognized the power that it has, and maybe it has extended it as far as you know, doing judicial activism right. and taking politics into law, definitely. So in that case, how, I mean, what will, the perspect what will be the perspective of the French and the American judge to that activism and to the fact that you can even go as far as creating public policies in judicial decisions. And if we are in the face of what we can maybe call a government of the judges, especially if we have cases like, for example, the U.S., when you have the government taking decisions that are overturned by the judges. Yep. And you have also, well, cases like that today in, in France where the government is really questioned on the decisions that are taken. And you can see the courts as the savers that are going to defend the rights of the people right. and, and the republic. So what will you think? Uh, so look, it seems to me that this is almost the most fundamental question of all judicial systems that I know of in the world today. Right? And that is basically what is and should be the power of judges and courts, right? And what should be that power relative to other branches of government, right? There is no question that if you go with the traditional optics, optics of the French system, it goes to great efforts to demonstrate that, that the judiciary is subservient to the political branches of government. That is a revolutionary dictate and one that is taken seriously, right? It's taken seriously even within the French Constitution, which lists the two political branches as branches of government and reduces um, the judiciary to an authority, not a full-fledged branch of government, right? So the idea of separation of powers in the French tradition is of rigid separation of powers of the judiciary from the political branches. That the judiciary cannot interfere with the executive and legislative branches. Okay? It's the reason for the existence of the Conseil d'État. Right? So the Council of State, right here, which handles public law issues, why? Because the judiciary cannot. It's not allowed to touch the decisions of the political branches of government. So, you know, Napoleon was not an idiot. He had other issues, but he was not an idiot. He understood, right, the need to have 
some kind of other institution to engage in this kind of review. And so he puts it within the executive branch, right? And he is really the first leader of the Conseil d'État. Um, and he was a micromanager. <laughs> okay. So that's the idea. There is no question that the more seriously you, you uh, allow for the idea that judges are going to have to make decisions, and the more seriously you allow them to make decisions, not only with respect to codified law, but also with respect to fundamental rights law of whatever provenance, whether it's constitutional law at the domestic level, or European EU law at the supranational level, or European uh, Convention of Human Rights on the European level, the judge is increasingly in a difficult position. Now, a couple of things. It was a lot easier for classic civilian systems on the French model when the division of jurisdiction was clear. It was a private law case. It was a criminal law case. The ordinary judiciary handled it. It was a public law case. Then the, the administrative tribunals and the Conseil d'État handled it. And then even in the post-war period, it's a question of a constitutional review of the legislator, the Constitutional Council handles it. But notice a couple of things. First of all, the terminology matters. To the French mind, institutional solutions are good, and terminology matters. The courts are the judicial courts. The public law <coughs> courts are not courts. They're tribunals. They're not courts. That's why they can touch the executive branch. And the constitutional court is not a court. The constitutional council. Okay? So, institutional distinctions, right, with terminological footnotes that are related to these jurisdictional differences. What's the problem? The problem is that increasingly, everybody handles fundamental rights and human rights, right? Why, if nothing else within the European tradition, because the European institutions have demanded it. So the European Court of Justice and the European Court of Human Rights have demanded that local courts, national courts, ordinary courts, actually handle fundamental rights and protect them, right? And lawyers are smart. <laughs> lawyers are smart. If we have a contract, and under that contract, under the governing legal norms, I'm going to lose, then if I'm going to be good for my client, I'm going to try and find a way to win. Right? So what am I going to do? I'm going to turn to some other body of law to try to find some way to win. And that means I'm going to turn to Europe, and I'm going to try and find some EU directive that conflicts, and I'm going to try and use that. Even more powerful than the EU directive will be European fundamental rights jurisprudence. And at that point, I'm going to say, look, the labor contract that we have entered into which does not allow me, if I leave my job, to go and work for another firm for another year. That restraint on my ability to go work somewhere else violates my fundamental right to work. It's a contract case. It's a private contract case. And we're now turned to fundamental rights. So at this point, Something important has happened, and that is the division, the nice old-fashioned division between ordinary courts, administrative courts, and constitutional council, I should say administrative tribunals, and the constitutional council has now been blurred. <laughs>
everybody in all of these different hierarchies are turning to fundamental rights. And it means that all of these courts or tribunals or councils are actually making use of them in ways that overturn existing legislation. So the ordinary judge can no longer pretend to simply apply codified law. Right? And this is the classic problem now. And the problem in many respects is jurisdiction. There had been a very careful construction that was meant to divide and split up judicial authority, what Americans would think of as a single judicial authority, into different realms. And now all of a sudden, for the first time, everyone is working with the same material. Um, and this means by definition that the question of judicial review and the question of judicial power and of judicial restraint is now a conversation that everybody has to have everywhere. But that's new. That's new. It used to be that you could say, look, we're making interpretive judgments, but we follow the code. But follow the code doesn't mean that the code answers the question for us. Right? It means that we are guided by the code, but we all know that there are different ways to interpret the code. That's one thing. It's a totally different thing to say, now, under European fundamental rights law or domestic constitutional law, the fundamental right to work means that we take the code provision and we just crush it. That's different. And to deal with that is a real problem. And they don't have an easy answer to that. It's an uncomfortable relation to it. It's uncomfortable even in the United States, even where we fully recognize the power of judges. That doesn't mean we like it. Right? It's our tradition, and we still don't like it. Right? We had a question in back. Go. Thank you. Well, actually, more than a question is... Thanks. So, more than a question, uh, it's uh, a few remarks that maybe can be discussed. So, two things. First of all, all of this presentation with which... I agree, in terms of its content, ex illustrates how historical factors have an impact on the institutional design of law. And actually, just as you mentioned, how the French Revolution and the reaction against the Ancien Regime and other factors may explain its, its structure, well, in terms of common law, one could also say that the itinerant judges, the model of, well, England at the time also explains why the judiciary has a different outlook and different dynamics, right? Absolutely. So I agree. Nevertheless, my only question, as a complement to Carlos's question, is whether this is not too much of a top-down approach. In what sense? If one examines this bottom-up, one could wonder whether, for instance, let's take the example of same-sex marriage. Uh, with the exception of Ireland, most other states in which this has been regulated have accepted this via judicial decisions, right? So one could wonder whether grassroots NGOs or their movements have attempted to use the, I mean, to use judicial actions which are valid in order to open up spaces that do not exist, and therefore this is a new historical transformation of how the judiciary is used by these groups when there are no venues open in the other traditional branches. So perhaps as a response to Carlos's question on whether there is a government of judges and so on, one could see that this is simply an example of a further historical process and transformation in which societies have been changing. Maybe the law doesn't answer to all expectations and so on. So there's, there's changes that also, I mean, somehow legal changes betray social changes. And on the other hand, maybe this is another example of how there are attempts to use law, 
legal transformation in order to bring about social engineering, social changes. So the expressive function of law. So this is, I agree with the presentation, this is just something that I've been thinking on for, for a while. So how, yeah, the law both serves in order to bring about changes but also reflect social changes. And these new dynamics of judicial power explain also different trends in society as such. That's all I wanted to say. Yeah, I, I, so, um, yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> um, so there's a great literature, um, and I really think it's great, um, that comes out of um, EU um, academics. And very often on the um, political science side, um, and in particular political science of judging. So the name that comes immediately to mind for me here is going to be Alex Stone Sweet, right, um, and um, and Martin Shapiro. Right? So these are going to be the two great names for this, and uh, they have a basic theory, or part of their theory includes this kind of idea, and they elaborate it, and they say, look, there's a kind of structural sympathy, uh, a kind of structural sympathy between courts and litigants. Litigants will come to courts for the protection of their own self-interests. Right? And they will bring and they will force litigation whether the courts want it or not. Right? They are going to come and they are now going to make rights claims of whatever kinds. Right? They're going to do it under European law if that's effective. They're going to do it under fundamental rights law if that's effective. But as soon as the opportunity presents itself, litigants will come. And they are going to put courts at every point in complicated positions. Because at every point, someone is going to be self-interested to push the boundary on any position that a court or a legislature has already taken. That's what a good lawyer does. The good lawyer says, look, the law has been interpreted to mean X, and then gives a broad interpretation of that interpretation. Because there isn't just one interpretation. Once the interpretation has been given, broad or narrow, there are going to be more lawsuits that are going to build off of that interpretation. right? And at that point, you get a kind of um, combination of work between the litigants and the courts, working together in a way that simultaneously increases the capacity of these civil society actors to put themselves in a better position, and simultaneously the capacity of the courts to empower themselves relative to the political branches of government, right? And this makes a kind of structural sympathy between the litigants and the courts that they go to, right? And the end result of this is exactly what you're describing. Now, um, which is to say, the courts increasingly being used in order to press social claims and by definition, by definition, they wouldn't be going to the courts to press the social claims if they were winning them in the legislature. Right? By definition. It's a loser's tactic. Okay? It's effective. It's not always effective. But all you need is it for it to be a little bit effective. And once it's a little bit effective, then you interpret it broadly and you do it again. Right? This is the basic idea of cause lawyering. Right? Now, this, so I think this is just plain true. Period. However, danger. This does not mean that courts are necessarily progressive institutions. One would, and this is a classic American and sometimes European mistake, is to say, oh look, this means that underrepresented 
sympathetic minorities have a chance to win things that they would not otherwise be in a position to win because of a dominant minority, a uh, majority, that crushes them, right? That looks sympathetic. Right? But careful, because they are not the only litigants. And indeed, you are going to get lots of litigation. You will get even more litigation, and I don't need to tell this to Latin Americans, right? that will be brought by well-funded, well-funded corporate actors, by definition. Why? Because they're well-funded, right? and because they have the interest and the capacity to bring the lawsuits. And there is no reason why their capacity to do that is not going to result in broad interpretations of property rights that will not, in the end, be very neoliberal in their flavor, right? So that if you sit there and say, oh, the increasing power of the courts and the increase of fundamental rights, is this something fundamentally progressive? Yes. Or something fundamentally right neoliberal? Answer, yes. <laughs> it's both. It's both. And now you need to go into the specifics of the particular culture and the particular judiciary in question to see which way it goes, but very often it goes both. Just master itself. Much depends also on the composition of a hidden court, because for instance, here in Colombia, we can see that the first stage of the constitutional court yeah. had a composition with certain left-leaning or other persons. The same decisions could not be expected within different courts. So I think you Americans are much more experienced and actually we can learn much about this because, I mean, you, you engage in judicial politics debates, also the notion of jury. So I think there's much to say. And after all, in the U.S., you have all of these debates about Kavanaugh and whether he was going to be appointed or not. I think this illustrates, aside from the accusations uh, of harassment, I think this also demonstrates how we I mean, the recognition of the importance of the composition. Okay, so this has to be true, right? So here locally um, uh, uh, and also heavily even on the inter-American court, in its early years, it had that flavor. There's just no question, right? Um, this is precisely, to some extent, the lesson of the French. The French are saying, what really matters is the institution. We want to know who sits on those institutions and how are they trained. And the way they are trained should actually represent what the political community considers to be its most fundamental values. And if you do that, then you can trust the institution. Right? Now that's fine if you have an idea that's a relatively coherent idea of what the tradition is and should be. The more conflicted public and knowledgeable opinion is about what should be the values of the judges in their decisions, then the more difficult it is to run this in the French style. Right? It's very difficult. But, you know, it's not just an American thing, right? If you go and you go to Germany, they understand this perfectly well. And I actually think that in many respects, they have the wisest approach. And the wisest approach is to say, look, if we are appointing judges, and in particular judges for a constitutional court, because they don't do this for their other courts, then we ought to recognize, along with Kelsen, that this is a fundamentally political exercise, and even more than Kelsen would ever have wanted, right? Because he only wanted negative, not positive decision-making. And if it is a fundamentally political exercise, not in the sense of everyday politics, but in the sense of large constitutional politics, then the people who sit on that tribunal ought to chosen by significantly political means. 
Does that mean that you need to have American style fights in the mud? And the answer to that is no. You don't need that. And in fact, I would tend to argue that those fights are actually at least as counterproductive as they are productive. Right? Um, so I do have a bit of the French in me. And I would tend to say, you know, it would be really good if we could combine a sensitivity to political difference and try to find a way to structure institutions in a way that's responsive to these political differences without having it fall into the most crass, low political debates possible. And the German version is to say, look, the, um, the houses of um, the Bundesrat and the Bundesstaat will each select a certain number of judges uh, for the constitutional court, and they will do so, and this is the key thing, by supermajority vote. So that actually, fundamentally, the center, both on the left and on the right, has to basically agree. There's an effective veto power on the, on the proposed candidates from the other side. Right? Um, and if you... Now look, is that neutral? No, that's not neutral. That is a structured institutional approach that puts its emphasis on the center, right? Um, given where we are in contemporary politics in much of the world today, my inclination, and it pains me to say it because I come out of the American critical tradition, so it pains me to say it, but given where politics is today, my inclination is to say, you know, center is not the end of the world. <laughs> That's depressing. <laughs> I think. Yes. So my question is about, um, according to. Uh. According to what's been said about the empowerment of the judges based on their interpretive function, and if I'm not wrong, on how this enables well function of the government. Now, doesn't it really open the door to a weak and a very flexible uh, legal system that will lead to for further problems and affecting directly the democracy by itself? Yeah, so I, uh, this is a great question. Um, uh, look, I'm a comparative law professor, and I, I love to teach, um, and I love to teach all over the world, right? So I also love to travel, so these things work well together. Um, I teach comparative law courses when I'm at home in New York, right? So I'm teaching it basically to common lawyers. I'm teaching about civil law systems. But I teach it when I'm in Paris or when I'm in Lisbon, um, and therefore I'm, I'm teaching um, common law, American common law, to civilians, right? Civilians, and this is a characteristic difference, civilians will raise this question long before American common lawyers will. Civilians will say, what about legal certainty? Right? Common lawyers are trained. Our first year of law school in the United States is basically training for this idea of broad and narrow interpretation. Right? And I bet that even one year of LLM, you realize that very fast. There is nothing that the American law professor enjoys more in the first year of law school than to ask a question, so here's the legal provision, how should it be interpreted in this case? And some eager student raises his or her hand and says, clearly the answer is that the plaintiff must win. And at this point, if you watch the professor, the professor begins to salivate. <laughs> Because the professor is going to reach behind the desk and take out a baseball bat 
and beat the student in public. <laughs> right? Or really, you think that clearly the plaintiff wins, right? And then comes up with a little bit of a different hypothetical and makes the student look like an idiot. Right? Of course, if the student had given the opposite answer that the defendant had, had, should win, the professor would salivate and do it again. Okay? This is the basic structure of first year American law school classroom. Public humiliation. I must say that over time it, it, it becomes less, less so. Um, uh, what's the lesson? The lesson is that in the American law school um, uh, classroom, the right answer is always, it depends. That's always the right answer. Now, once everyone understands that, the professor is going to start saying, because the students are all going, well, who should win? Answer, it depends. Answer, it depends. Answer, it depends. At some point, the professor looks at the students and says, okay, wise guy, on what does it depend? Okay, and then things get difficult. But that's the basic structure, which means that by definition, the training is to teach people to be comfortable with the idea of uncertainty. Only a, a simple-minded lawyer, American realist thinking, only a simple-minded lawyer thinks that law decides a case. If you do that, it means that you are not sophisticated. That's what people in the street think. Right? Uh, no vehicles in the park, the classic example. No vehicles in the park. Does this mean that little Bobby cannot bring his bicycle into the park? Answer? <laughs> it depends. <laughs> That's the right answer. <laughs> but almost always, in the civilian classroom, the hand will come up, and the answer is either yes or no. Why yes or why no? Because a vehicle is something that moves you from here to there. A bicycle is a vehicle, therefore he can't bring the bicycle. QED. Right? And then the professor salivates, takes out the baseball bat, and goes, oh really? Does that mean that actually people cannot walk in the park? Because after all, they have legs. And the legs get them from here to there. And there were no people in the park. Is that what you're saying? And, you know, the students go, uh. <laughs> Are you actually telling me that actually if grandmama has a heart attack in the park, that, that the ambulance can't come to take her out? Okay. And then some, some student on the other side says, well, obviously, um, this means that all vehicles are allowed in the park. Right? Okay. And then you say, it goes crazy. And it always ends up with the final one, which is, well, actually, can you have a bronze tank put on a pedestal for a World War II memorial? Okay. Vehicle or not vehicle? Okay. The whole point of the lesson is it depends. And you're going to have to explain why. But as a general rule, my civilian students, if I'm teaching in Lisbon or Paris, they're not comfortable with this. Right? Um, so this is a basic problem. Right? Um, that said, the, uh, what I hope that the discussion from inside the Cour de Cassation, what I called when I lied, the fake Ohio case, it shows clearly that French judges are completely aware of this. They are completely aware of broad and narrow interpretation. It's not as if they don't understand that. right? <coughs> it's not as if code solves that. It doesn't. Because the code has to be interpreted like this or like that. It's not as if precedent solves it. Because the precedent can be interpreted like this or like that.
The question is how to deal with it. And the American answer is, a, a, you know, it's a Protestant answer. The answer is by public debate. You go to church, you confess publicly, and you debate. That's not the civilian answer. Right? The civilian answer is, especially in the French version, Train people. Make them be specialists. Let them be experts. Let there be a meritocratic hierarchy and put them in a position to do the work that has to be done. And that doesn't make it that there's more certainty or less certainty. It's just handled by the proper institutions. Right? Um, and Americans say down with institutions, right? Um, so I think that the uncertainty thing is a fascinating question because even though civilians have approaches to deal with the uncertainty, there is still that resistance to it depends. To me, that means that one has to give an explanation of those systems that simultaneously doesn't discard the code and doesn't discard the syllogism, but that incorporates the internal institutional component. Both things are important, right? That there should be some control, right? But now the question is, how is that control actually manifesting? Oh, I put it religiously. <laughs> My well, groups after. <laughs> I have like a really basic question. Uh, I don't understand why the French system has like the conseiller rapporté yeah. and the avocat general if the decision is going to be the code says this, so apply this article. And that's it. I don't get it why they have to have this discussion if it's going to be private and the decision is going to be so short and no one is going to know what happened. So um, let me make sure I understand you. Are, you. are you asking why are they having all of the discussion? If, if the decision is going to be like... If the decisions are going to be that short. Yeah. I think the answer is because they recognize that the decision is difficult. Right? They recognize that the decision is difficult. Now, there is, however, a conundrum. There's a problem. And that is that because the judgment is so short, right, there are consequences to that. There are real consequences. And if the debate is an internal debate within the judiciary, there are consequences to that. If, in fact, a client comes to a lawyer and says, okay, um, can I enter into a contract like this or like that? Can I sue for this or that? How is the lawyer supposed to answer? If the code provision can be read broadly or narrowly, and if the judgment is short, and doesn't give real guidance, how is the lawyer supposed to advise the client? Okay, that's a real problem. That's a real problem. And it's a cost that comes from this. All right, there's also an answer. The answer is, of course, that the lawyer will look at judgments, right? and try and figure out what the logic was behind the syllogism. Okay? And if the lawyer is any good, the lawyer will begin to see patterns in the syllogisms and say, oh, I see. 
I see this, I see that. If we go back to the original judgment that I read to you, that judgment, awful judgment of the little boy who poked the eye out of his friend, right? Important judgment or unimportant judgment? In other words, of course it's important for the family, but it was a legally significant judgment or it was just a routine judgment? It was a hugely important judgment. Why? Because it was a judgment that was making a, a new interpretation about what civil responsibility, what the civil responsibility regime was going to be. Was it going to be a fault regime? Or was it going to be a, a non-fault regime, a strict liability regime? And in this case, the answer was strict liability. But if you knew anything about French tort law before this judgment, you would know that it was a fault regime. So the judgment, even though it was just about a little boy, right, was actually an enormously important, what the French call revirement, an overturning of existing jurisprudence. Okay? How would the lawyer know that? There were signs. There were individual words in there. Remember, there was something in it said, but whereas, a French court never says, but whereas, unless they are formally rejecting something. And almost always, that means that they are rejecting a legal theory, and if they're recognizing that the legal theory has to be rejected, it means that they are overturning something. Okay? So if you go to law school and you're a good lawyer, you come to recognize the signs. That's the first thing. The second thing is that if you looked at the, at the citation for that judgment, it would look something like this. Um, Cass Civ Premier. 3 January, uh, or maybe not 3 January, right 13 January uh, 2012, D. 2012.1.695 um, um, uh, note Le Breton. Okay, now we decode. Judgment of the first chamber of the civil chamber of the Court of Cassation, decided on January 13, 2012, published in Deleuze, that's the main legal publisher, in its 2012 version in part one on page 695. What's that? The drafting. Notes. No. It's not the drafting judge, because the whole point is that the drafting judge does it behind closed doors. So it's a good answer, but it's wrong. There, we, <laughs> we can beat up even the professor. <laughs> <laughs> um, other theory? You were just stretching. Oh. <laughs> other theory? Somebody who commented? Yes. Uh, Very good. <laughs> it's, an, it's, it's you. It's an academic commentator on the judgment. And if you open up the publication that does, you will find something that for an American is unbelievable. You will get the judgment. It will be a syllogism. It will be this long. And it will be followed in the reports by a comment, a case comment, by a professor. And that will be four times longer. And what is the professor going to say? The professor is going to say, this is an incredibly important judgment. <laughs> in this judgment, the Court of Cassation First Chamber, in its civil panel, has overturned 
the long-standing jurisprudence of that chamber with regards to civil responsibility. Since the judgment of 3 November 1936, the Court of Cassation has been operating under a fault regime um, for civil responsibility. In the famous judgment, as commented by the famous professor so-and-so, blah, 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 blah. Over the course of time, that canonical approach has been subject to ever greater criticism. Professors have divided on whether they should actually maintain this approach or adopt a new one. Over the course of time, there have been ever more pressing arguments about the need to recognize that social circumstances have changed. Now, um, insurance is the norm, not the exception. So what's really in question here is not whether the, whether the plaintiff will be awarded damages, but who will actually pay them. Right? It is clearly unfair for the plaintiff not to be able to recover. After all, the child has lost her eye, right? There, why should the parents have to pay for that when there is no fault? The answer clearly is that we must be under a strict liability regime so that the poor plaintiff family can get their medical costs and the insurer will pay in a no-fault system. Right? And this explanation will go for four pages. This is good policy, it's bad policy, it's good for these reasons, it's bad for those reasons, these professors will disagree, but this is the right approach. Okay, if you are a, if you are a lawyer in the French tradition, the answer is read the cases, read the notes carefully. And that's the only note that gets published in... Great question! Uh, is it the only note? There are all kinds of paradoxes. It always comes back to institutions. Deleuze is a publisher. Well, guess what? There are other publishers. Oh. And they're publishing other notes by other professors. There are all kinds of time questions you might want to ask. Like, how can they publish the judgment and the commentary at the same time? How do they decide, decide which professor is going to? Okay, if you are going to be a good lawyer today, functioning in a cross-border environment, rule number one, assume everybody's intelligent. If you have an explanation, that is, they do it like that because they're idiots, they're not the idiots. <laughs> right? Careful, careful, careful. You need to know the detail of how things work on the ground. How do they really work? Right? And so the answer here is that actually the limited explanation by the judge produces a need, and the need is for explanation. The explanation cannot be given by the judge. So who gives the explanation? The professor. In some sense, the French professor lives in a symbiotic relationship with the judge. And the two of them together make governing jurisprudence. Do you see that? You could say that if you were to be an intelligent American comparatist, you would not make the mistake of comparing American judgments to French judgments. You have to compare it to French judgments and the appended commentary. And if you think about it that way, have the French actually managed to limit the power of their judges? Yes. By the way, what's always the right answer? Depends. <laughs> I'm going to let it go this time. <laughs> but the answer is, it depends.
It depends on what you mean by limiting the power. Okay? Tell me what you mean. How have they limited the power? Because when they are deciding, they are, they are thinking what the note is going to say. Yes, very good. They themselves are depending on the note. They are sharing normative power with the academic so that there is a splintering of, of law-making power. That's even the wrong term. There's a splintering of interpretive authority between the judge and the scholar. Whereas in the American system, where the scholar is relatively unimportant, relatively unimportant, all of that power gets <coughs> combined in the figure of the judge. You see? But I honestly think it's the opposite. I think that the judge is very powerful because the judge is saying, this is my decision, period. Why? Because I am the judge. And I have the power to say so. And all you have to do is comply with what I'm saying. Yes, but careful. And if you want to understand it, then go to the, you know, go to the professors. They will explain it. They will put it down to the people. But all you have to know from me is that this is the law. Okay, but careful. That authority is, and this is, it depends. Depends on what you mean by judicial authority. If you mean by judicial authority, their capacity today to make an explanation that they do not really have to justify. It's more or less a fiat. The answer is yes, but it depends. Be the question is, how do you want to think of judicial authority? You want to think about it in the case today, or you want to think about it as it operates over time? And that's a different thing, right? Does the French judge have the power that the American judge has to dictate what the conversation is going to be about how to interpret law? The answer is no, because the French judge cannot give enough information to do that. Whereas the American judge says, look, it's hard to interpret the law. We recognize that. It should be interpreted this way or that way. And there is a four-part test right, about how to resolve these difficult questions. Right? If the constitutional provision is read like this, if it does not discriminate like that, if it fairly does this or that, and, if, and sets out a whole bunch of different standards, and it would be malpractice for a a lawyer in the next case not to follow the four-part test. Can the French judge that do that? The answer is no. No. The French judge cannot do that. So, yes, indeed, lots of power in the particular case, but much less power over time. What well, point? I'm trying. We can talk about it at lunch. I don't want to. And here you go. Yes. Small question. You said that the difference between these two is the idea of democracy, and that the American one tends to be more populist. But what happens when the courts are constantly changing what a fundamental right means, or the extent of it? Uh, doesn't it become less populist and they can also um, tend to lose authority because they are just changing it and it tends to happen here in Colombia? I don't know. If so <laughs> there's no easy answer to this, right? Judges change their interpretations all the time. Is it because they're doing something wrong? Now I'm going to speak as an American legal realist. The answer is no. It's not because they're doing something wrong. The only way they could not change what they're doing is if they wave at a pre-existing code provision or precedent and then never explain what they're doing. 
Because people are bringing cases. They're bringing cases all the time. And if the judge is going to be honest and say, look, we decided this kind of case last year, and now we're being asked to interpret that case in a different fact scenario. And, it, and the question is before us, how do we interpret how we decided last year? Do we interpret it broadly?